In any case, this is not an either or situation. Any of the uses in the ordinance would still be allowed. The event venue would be additional. Other things I've noted during this process for this amendment. Apparently the Planning Commission did not see a copy of the Elm Street plan when it was making its recommendation, even though it is called an official plan and it should have been part of their thought process. It seems that the Planning Commission and the Council may have been under the impression that Mr. English inherited the 68 High Street property and is stuck with a problem property under the current zoning. In fact, he purchased portions of it from his siblings and now owns it together with his wife, Deborah. Did they not investigate the zoning before purchasing? The property is currently approved for both a bed and breakfast and a vacation rental. So it would not likely meet the standard for a use variance, even if a vent venue were described in the ordinance. Again, focus keeps returning to the desires of one property owner rather than finding the most appropriate area for such a use within the borough. I've considered the fact that despite being allowed to have small magnitude businesses such as a coffee shop, bank, or limited commercial, it hasn't happened within the Elm Street overlay. Maybe that's because owners and rental residents prefer the neighborhood to be primarily residential. Maybe this is something to consider during the upcoming zoning review process rather than doing piecemeal additions. Thanks. Okay. Public comment. Evening Council, Mr. President. My name is Sam Weiser. I'm with Salzman Hughes. I represent Scott English. I'm also a property owner at 112 Baltimore Street. And I'm here this evening to talk about the proposed text amendment. And just a, a procedural question, Mr. President. Uh, would you allow for feedback during the, the roundtable discussion about the text amendment? Or would you rather receive public comment now? Most of it I'd probably rather receive now simply because uh, we've been through. I think we have a pretty good handle on what Mr. English would like and on what other parties would like and uh, that way we can kind of move through it. Um, but if we get to a juncture where there's something new uh, that comes up, we can certainly hear that. Understood. Then, then I'll offer, offer my comments now and I, I believe the council has received a copy of the letter that I sent uh, late last year uh, regarding this proposed amendment. So I, I won't uh, go over all of those things in detail. Uh, but one of the things that you look at with a zoning amendment is is it consistent with the planning documents? And I think has already been mentioned tonight, uh, there are two planning documents that directly impact this text amendment. Uh, the first being the borough's Elm Street plan and what's being proposed here. And again, this is not just this particular property. This is any property within the Elm Street overlay district. Uh, it would create a mixed use that creates a sustained level of activity within the neighborhood. And that's what my clients are seeking to create at this unique property. Um, in fact, most of what my clients propose for this property, and again, it's not just this property that's subject to the amendment, but we're talking about my client's property tonight because they're the ones that requested the amendment. Uh, the uses that are already permitted by right in this zone are cultural centers and historical and interpretive facilities. So that, that could be done now. The balance of what my clients are requesting to do at this particular property are already uses that are being conducted at neighboring properties, right down the street, weddings, social gatherings, fellowship dinners, et cetera. So there's not a different impact on the neighborhood. These things are already happening across the street and, and two doors down. Uh, it's also consistent with the Central Adams Joint Comprehensive Plan. Your, your joint comprehensive plan that you've adopted uh, shows this district to be in the downtown core district in the future. So not even R2, but, but expanding that downtown core, which promotes those, those commercial mixed use type <laughs> uses uh, at my client's property. Uh, the Central Adams Joint Comprehensive Plan also shows this property as a designated growth area in which you want to encourage commercial uses and, and more activity within the neighborhood. Um, the, the next thing you look at with the zoning amendment is, uh, is that zoning amendment crafted in a way that's unduly burdensome? And I think there are two problematic provisions in the amendment as, as last written uh, with some of the provisions that had come out um, during this process. What, one is the limit of two events per month. Um, that, that's an arbitrary number. Uh, that's not to tied any, it's not tied to any reasonable limitation. Uh, it was just picked out of the air. Um, the, the churches down the, the street aren't limited to two weddings a month or two funerals. That'd be kind of weird. Um, uh, they, they, they conduct their business. They operate under the existing requirements that you have in place. 
You've got a nuisance ordinance. You've got noise ordinances that try to constrain those uses to make sure that they're respectful of the neighborhood. Uh, the, the uses down the street can do it, so can my clients. Uh, the other thing that, that is problematic is, an, is the annual plan. Um, I, I think you'll find that that annual plan concept is not only unduly burdensome for the applicant, but it's unduly burdensome for the municipality to attempt to administer that. Uh, oftentimes, these events aren't planned more than a year in advance, um, so that it, it would be very difficult for my clients to administer, and it would create additional procedural requirements for the borough that, that I don't know that you want. And I don't think it does anything more to protect the interest of the public, quite frankly. Again, you've got your nuisance ordinances, you've got noise ordinances, things of that nature. This isn't just about one property. It's about all properties within a similarly situated zone, within the Elm Street overlay, and within uh, your, hopefully, as you implement your comprehensive plan within your downtown core zone, this is a unique property. It's the right thing for the property, and it's a way that you can continue to preserve and utilize the historic properties within the borough. So if there's anything that comes up during the discussion tonight, I'd be happy to provide feedback or responses. So thank you for your time and your consideration. Public comment. Okay, if there is no further public comment, we will proceed uh, to our first item under old business, which is the zoning text amendment, which was subject to much of the uh, public comment we received this evening, if not all of it. Um, procedurally, uh, just the members of council, I had sent out uh, a list of items that seemed that they needed attention um, as first, second, and third. Uh, related to some of the requests from Mr. English. Uh, further, though, we can discuss any portion of the ordinance that anyone would like to raise. My goal would be uh, to leave this evening with a, an ordinance uh, that can be advertised uh, for a public hearing in February. So it has come time to reach a uh, final set of language. <coughs> I'm not asking that you make a final determination on whether or not you would pass such an ordinance, but we need to have a set of language to vote on. It has reached that time. Okay, so I'm going to ask this evening, as we go through uh, those portions, I'm going to be looking for uh, whether or not uh, you would support the draft including those items. Okay, questions about kind of how we'll go through that? Um, so the first item that was brought up uh, was mentioned there during public comment uh, and this dealt with the um, limitation of events with outdoor activities being limited to maximum of twice per calendar month. Uh, so this is kind of the first item that I'd like to <coughs> discuss if there is interest in altering that language. Uh, the default here would be to leave things in the ordinance as is, but if there's interest in altering it, I need to know that there are are four members of council and what that change will be if we just do, do not do a limit or do a um, something else okay I'll yeah move. mr. Lawler um, I think the uh, two limits a month is ridiculous we have no kind of limits on any other business in this town that are remotely familiar with that um, I don't know how it's going to be enforced so I just think it, uh, from my viewpoint, it needs to go. Okay. So the two a month, we keep the, uh, I'm not really discussing the Friday, Saturday, Sunday at this point. We can add that to the discussion if desired. Okay. So Butterfield, I see nodding. Yes, I was agreeing that we would do the um, Saturday, Sunday business later. Okay. I agree with um, John that it seems foolish, silly to limit it to two. Um, I don't understand what that purpose would be, uh, and I disagree with any limiting of the number of events per month. Okay. I can jump around, too. Don't feel like you have to <laughs> I agree. go next. Okay. All right, Mr. Carr, please also. <coughs> I agree with my colleagues spoken so far too. It seemed pretty arbitrary to me. Um, did you want to hold off on talking about to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or do you want to pull that into it? Let's, um, let me just wrap up this and then okay. we'll hit Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. I'm for keeping it as it is. Okay. Mr. Moon? No, <coughs> no opinion. No opinion. Okay. 
Alright. And I think I would be inclined to to lose the limit also. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. I thought, just for clarification, yes. I thought the two a month was limited to the size of the event. Did I miss something? It, it does okay, involve, no. there is a relationship. Um, there are a number of different items related to size. So there is separately an item that deals with mac maximum attendance of 100. This portion, make sure that I get this correct, dealt with the twice per month. <coughs> no, at this segment it did not include it. In one of the drafts at okay. one point, I know that you are correct, it included 70 or 75 or something of that nature, and that is not in this uh, current draft. So there is no size relationship in this draft. There's one that says maximum attendance for outdoor events shall be 100 people, including staff. Right. <coughs> yeah, and then under a, that, it yeah. says event with outdoor activities are limited to a maximum of twice per calendar year and may only be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Right. But the, the, the regularity doesn't have a relationship to the size in this draft. Okay. All right. That, um, I think, does take us then to the... Um, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday issue. If Ms. Lawson, if you'd like to raise that, we can yeah. discuss that. That that seemed um, pretty restrictive and unrealistic <coughs> to me in terms of somebody who was using this as a business. And I'm, I'm wondering why we'd restrict it to just Friday, Saturday, Sunday when maybe there's a, a you know a luncheon by a historic historical group on a Thursday afternoon uh, that wants to have a luncheon. And so I, it, you know, I, I don't understand the rationale for restricting it to the. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to speak for why that was put in there. I think it <coughs> dealt with kind of the concept of weekdays and that type of thing. Um, you know, these things go into the evening, but I certainly understand that while I think we have used and different people have used discussions of you know, weddings, parties, this type of thing, um, it doesn't necessarily capture the totality of the types of events that could occur. Right. And I think that, you know, in the summertime, I could see a group of people having a reunion and maybe wanting to do it on a, <clears throat> you know, a Monday if they're there for the whole weekend, and that might be something they cap, cap off their events or, or starting it on Wednesday or Thursday. It just, you know, it seemed really restrictive. <clears throat> Mr. Berger? Yeah, it, it can be any day. Okay. Mr. Moon? No, <coughs> Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, one of the other items we received dealt with uh, tent size, which when I was going through the draft, I did not notice a specific relationship to tent size in our draft. Now, Mr. Lawber astutely pointed out, I think, that this would probably be covered under the fire code, and this is sort of a, um, this is to me something that probably Clem and PMCA will end up dealing with in terms of the tent size. There is a um, setback that is included. Um, a tenant foot setback with screening, uh, and that's in um, <coughs> double Roman numeral 5 3A. Let's pull that up real quickly here as I go through. And that was front and side setbacks 10 feet with screening when adjacent to a residential use or district. I so. see that with other properties. I think this property, I, I have been there a couple of times to look at it and look at what was done with the fencing and the, you know, the planting of the, the shrubs and all. Um, but this property actually almost has its own setback with that little bit of a hill. It's got that little bit of a hill that almost is kind of a natural setback. I realize this is something that would apply to other properties as well, but I just wanted to say. Yeah, and this deals specifically with front or side. Sure. Um, but that little hill goes all the way. So you're discussing kind of specifically the front. Um, and this is one of the items where with the 
there was kind of a request here related to to adjusting something that I didn't really see in the ordinance, um, unless I'm mistaken. I didn't see a tent size specification in the ordinance as written. It was something that was we had also got a left uh, to the fire code, I believe. Didn't we also get a recommendation from the planning commission <coughs> on tent size? I believe in we did, review. and that was what was in. I'm a, <coughs> to let, let the parcel size dictate the tent. <coughs> yeah, and I guess where I was heading when I read through the, the ordinance in detail and I'm checking all the lines, I just did not see that. And so that I think that the way that the fire code would be applied, I think that's a limiting factor. Um, certainly the parcel size would also be a limiting factor because of the setbacks and location of the structure and those things all kind of work together. Um, But I guess what I'm asking here, having not really seen that in the draft, is just kind of for some confirmation that it's not there. And I said, Mr. Eastman, kind of, you know, looking. <laughs> um, but also, um, it, so. if there was any desire to change the, uh, the setback, I thought that a 10-foot setback in town like that's probably a, a reasonable thing to, to have um, next to residential use. But if there is someone who would like to make a change to that, I'd be, now's the time to hear that. It's not dissimilar to other um, locations, other zones, or other uses in that zone. Um, and then the, uh, the third request which we had identified was if there was any desire, this goes to the um, permitted zones and special exception zones, <coughs> and if there was a desire to alter really what is early in the ordinance um, changing that within the Elm Street from a special exception to a permitted use by right. Uh, and Mr. Eastman, it might be a good moment to explain the, the difference between those. Um, actually, um, both a permitted use and a special exception are uses that are allowed as a matter of right. However, um, the uh, permitted use does not require um, a uh, applicant to uh, go through a zoning proceeding, a zoning hearing, to meet certain criteria that are placed in the ordinance um, as requirements for you to be able to conduct that use. So in other words, uh, a special exception is something that is permitted, however, you require the, um, the zoning hearing board would have sole um, jurisdiction to determine whether or not a proposed use meets all of the necessary criteria in order to get approval for that use. A permitted use, um, basically, um, the applicant would just be dealing with our zoning officer um, to get a zoning permit. They would, of course, check the various requirements, uh, make sure that their, those operations are being done, but you don't need to go through a formal hearing process. So is there a desire to change that, or shall we leave that as a special exception? Personally, I think it should be a permitted, permitted use, not special exception. I, I agree with Chad. I mean, if we're going to have the setback regulations, 10 size is covered by the fire code, uh, are the, are the other ordinances are in place, why make them go to a zoning hearing it makes no sense to me. I would agree. It just adds another layer. <coughs> I feel we've given enough thought and discussion to our ordinances that if they are followed, then um, I think it would be just fine, as Chad said. I mean, I think the purpose of the special exception hearing is essentially to hear the public and adjacent, correct? Well, I, I think really. primarily that would be a situation where you have uh, the council would, pl would place a number of criteria on you being able to conduct that use. And so you need to go through a hearing process, if you will, um, to, for the applicant to demonstrate their ability or their intentions to apply to those or um, to apply those conditions or uh, um, 
restrictions to their use. So the difference is, is that this will be heard, held by the, uh, heard by the zoning hearing officer, essentially Ms. Marshall. It'll be an administrative. Administratively, administrative she will administrative address process. that. Sure. As opposed to, I'm thinking of when we've had things uh, done by special exception where there's a hearing and the public comes to essentially testify to the effect of whether or not they believe it'll have an impact. I mean, we saw that with the uh, some uses, I think, in the industrial area. Uh, but it was relatively yeah. minimal. I think it's more about the argument of whether or not they can meet the requirements. I mean, certainly a zoning hearing is a public hearing, but even in those circumstances, um, if um, the zoning hearing board needs to be looking at whether or not somebody is affected by the application, uh, another property owner is affected by the application before their testimony can be presented and considered relevant. Now the proceedings are open to the public. Okay. Um, but essentially it's just that it would be administered rather than right. go to that board. Again, a special exception comes within the exclusive jurisdiction of the Zoning Hearing Board, the Zoning Hearing Board would listen to the evidence and apply that to uh, whatever cur uh, criteria or parameters were set forth in the ordinance. Okay. I believe I have where Mr. Carr is, Mr. Lauber, Ms. Lawson, Mrs. Butterfield, Mr. Berger. Sounds like you already have four already. Okay. Yes. All right. <coughs> That's one way to look at it. Uh, all right, so the draft would reflect at this point um, no limitation on the number of times per month, uh, no day of the week limitation. Um, that other item, the ten item, there's really no change, uh, and this will be categorized as a permitted use in the Elm Street overlay. So this is the point where I kind of arrive at. Um, any other items that any of you have identified that you'd like to discuss within it? The ordinance. Like five, can we talk about five? The okay. operational requirements or is that jumping ahead? No, that's fine. Um, so yeah, we were, we were in that a little bit, I guess, uh, which, With C, um, which items? Right, I raised the issue about C. I just, I wanted to just talk about how realistic it is to say that all out D. Um, I'm sorry, okay. Letter D where the activities associated with the event have to cease by nine on Sundays and 10 on Fridays and Saturdays or whatever days we're saying now, I guess, I guess the weekday would be nine o'clock then. But I'm just wondering That's true, how that would have to be altered to reflect right, that. Right, 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 that has to be changed. But I'm just wondering, you know, an event at, uh, that ends, that everything is over by 10 o'clock, so I'm imagining uh, a wedding on a, a Friday or a Saturday that would end at, at 10 o'clock. That doesn't seem unreasonable to me, um, but it would have to end before that if you expect the cleanup and all to be done by 10 o'clock as well. And I'm just wondering, can we discuss that a little bit in terms of how that would look if guests were gone by <coughs> 10 o'clock? We uh, made that provision to adhere to the noise ordinance. The noise ordinance, yep, I remember so that. So the concern was that caterers, DJs, whomever might have equipment, vehicles, mm -hmm. um, all manner of cleanup <coughs> would be just like our <coughs> trash collectors, making too much noise for people to sleep. Mm -hmm. So I just raised the question, if, if we already have the noise ordinance that addresses that, then why is it in here? I guess what I would say, and I, I comment this respectfully to Mr. Weiser too, but <coughs> the enforcement and ability to enforce the noise ordinance and nuisance ordinance in this town are notoriously difficult. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about the matter. So it's, you're kind of setting someone up for a scenario where that's going to be a, a neighborly conflict. Um, and I do think that, you know, some of the other items <coughs> I have some misgivings on, um, but I'm okay. Um, the time issue, I think, you know, you're next to somebody's home. Um, that's something I think does require some attention. Um, can we lean on those? We certainly can, and perhaps this council will elect to. Mm -hmm. um, but I think of what we went through with things like the trash, where like we specified very specifically. Uh, but I was surprised to find out that you can do construction at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, the list of things you can do before you can pick up trash. 
because I told I told my contractor to wait until seven. Uh, you missed that half hour of work there. Well, I tell you what, I'm not saying they always did. I told them to. <laughs> my Mason's a, was a go-getter, um, but uh, I think that's the intent. If there's a desire to change that, we certainly can change that. Well, then I would raise the question again: uh, If there are already events and things that are being held in this dis in this zone. Are we holding them to the same? You have to stop at 10 p.m. on Friday or Saturday? Can I think they... to me the big difference with that is that everything that was raised, and unless I'm looking at the properties incorrectly, uh, any number of those churches on that street, these are all enclosed spaces. Mm -hmm. And there's something very different about noise traveling <coughs> you know, from an enclosed space than there is from an open yard. And, and their weddings are not at, not going on at 8, 9, 10 at night, which we've been talking about similarities with the, the churches, with weddings and events, but generally they, they don't have events late at night. Generally, but they could. But, but they don't. Yeah, just the relevance But that's of my point. Is like here we are nipping again, and we're, we're talking about things that are well, and, and to be very direct with this, so we look at this not just as kind of almost the singular property, which can be dangerous, but also the singular overlay, which can also be dangerous. Um, <clears throat> these additional requirements are not specific to the Elm Street overlay either. <coughs> so if somewhere, someone were to do this in another zone uh, where that might not be the same concern, adjacent residential areas that would also limit that so uh, that's just something else to to be aware of uh, if you were in say the tourist commercial the same limitation applies <clears throat> I mean if we're talking about just an, another way to help the enforcement of the noise ordinance that some people in our borough don't pay attention to then fine put it in there but remove the um, well, you know the things we already discussed about how many times right so you're which, okay if you think that's all right i think i think it's a very important that the verbiage be exact from the noise ordinance so we're not recreating some other red tape and hassle it needs to be what is what it's in the noise noise ordinance copy and paste it to this okay does that make sense yeah what i'd kind of like to do is i think i can pull that will you folks discuss that if there's other input on the concept I guess what I'm saying is don't reinvent the wheel it's, just, we, let's, right. it's already yeah. the noise ordinance is as written see what it says. I don't think it's about <coughs> reinventing Copy that. the put, wheel put it there I don't think it's about reinventing the wheel I think it was about if we're creating a new use that is right uh, unlimited and by right and we accidentally give somebody the ability to violate an existing ordinance then we're not really doing our homework right which is so, what I'm so the limitations were meant to uh, coincide with the noise ordinance right and those were based on I believe not only staff recommendations but also our lengthy deliberations mm -hmm. in fact we are undoing much here tonight that we all deliberated on at length so it's very true. Like the noise ordinance specifically, well, no, the section I'm looking at is public rights of way. The noise ordinance itself has various differences for various activities. It does list an item called events, which lists 11, 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. Is it possible to put a line in that the <coughs> events with outdoor activities must adhere to the Gettysburg Borough noise ordinance, period? So you're referring to the verb, the legalese that's in the noise ordinance already. Is that? I think that's, that would be more obviously redundant. Um, let me see what it says here. 
because it gives <coughs> hours, but it also talks about the types of things. So actually, those hours and the noise ordinance I spoke of are provided exemptions mm -hmm. that you can have block parties, concerts, carnivals, festivals, fireworks, provided that they do not occur between those hours. Um, there are numerous listed acts that are prohibited. Many of, well, some of which have the 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. provision. So things like loading and unloading is in there, which is something I think is being discussed. Um, I don't know about the use of power tools, if that really applies. Musical instruments is listed, um, which is listed in, let's see, radios, televisions, musical instruments, and on similar devices operating, playing, or permitting the operation or playing of any radio or audio equipment, including from a vehicle, sound amplifier, television, musical instrument, or similar device, which produces, reproduces, amplifies, amplifies sound, one, at any time in such a manner to cause a noise disturbance across a property line. Or two, in such a manner as to cause a noise disturbance across a property line <coughs> or at 50 feet from such noise creating device, whichever is less, when the noise creating <coughs> device operated in a vehicle or hand carried on a public right of way. So then the <coughs> next question becomes what constitutes a noise disturbance? which is defined as, in addition to <coughs> several other things that are listed, <coughs> any sound that's unpleasant, annoying, offensive, loud, or obnoxious to a reasonable person of normal sensibilities. So that becomes kind of difficult sometimes. Chief, you like that one? Um, unusual for the time of day or location of where it is produced or heard. That's not particularly great either or detrimental to the health, comfort, or safety of persons or animals, or to the reasonable enjoyment of property or the lawful conduct of business because of the loudness, duration, or character of the noise. And this is where I think I remember many moons ago during motorcycle times of year that this whole thing kind of like, oh, Sarah, you're here, this detonated kind of, and I guess John, in everybody's faces. It just didn't really stand up. I was not on council, but I can remember that happening, and there was a big discussion about the noise ordinance, and I think they even had bought decimal meters? I think we did. That weren't worth a hill of beans, basically, at the end of it. So that's my hesitation when you say point to the noise ordinance. I hear what you're saying, right? Why create another layer of complication? But that's, that's what, every time I hear the word noise ordinance, I get a little concerned. <coughs> because I know the history of trying to enforce the noise ordinance is not great. But it is, as you say, another layer mm -hmm. that you're not wrong in any way um, in that effect. So shall we keep the hours or shall we change them to reflect the noise I just, ordinance? I don't, know how, to, I don't know how to move this along, but I, I'm, when it says all outdoor activities associated with the event, must cease by this certain times, including the setup and cleanup. Well, I guess, if, I mean, to move it along, I would, I would favor keeping it as it is. Are there others that favor that? Or to, and if not, we need to make a change, and then let's figure out what the change is. So are there others that would keep it as is? Mr. Berger? Anyone else keep as is? Okay, if not, then we need to talk about what the change is going to be. Um, we could strike it. We could do 11 p.m., which reflects your noise ordinance. Uh, let me look back at the draft here again. I think if it reflected the noise ordinance, it would be more, you know, that would be more aligned with it. I'd be more comfortable with that personally. So in that in that sense it would essentially say eleven PM. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm hearing eleven PM. Yeah. yeah, I'll see what my colleagues say. 
11 p.m. Whatever they were. I think that's a That's what it says for that type <coughs> of thing. Mr. if I may, that yes. consistency, I think, is, as Patty just said, of 11 p.m. Your noise ordinance says 11 p.m. Now this ordinance says 11 p.m. Consistency means a great deal when it comes to enforcement sure. of things. So I think if, if you were to say 11 p.m. in this, I don't think that's unreasonable <coughs> because that's what your noise ordinance says. So if you're consistent across ordinances, I think you're much further ahead. I'll keep it short. And that was kind of my point with saying whatever the legal lease is in the noise ordinance, we should go with that. But isn't isn't it a certain time on weekends and a certain time on <coughs> the noise ordinance? Thank you. I was looking at it just now. All right, is it all 11 p.m. seven days a week? So it's it not. A... There's nothing that's truly universal, <coughs> but it goes based on activity, mm -hmm. and the vast majority are 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., including construction domestic power tools, loading and unloading. The differences are, uh, they are sort of outliers. There's one in here that deals with blasting. That's an outlier, that's seven to four. Um, that might be it, but I noticed that, you know, that was something that stuck <laughs> out when I started seeing different times. And they, they put 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. several times within uh, the ordinance. So, Mr. Carr, 11 p.m.? I mean, that makes sense to me. That makes more sense to me, yes. Right. Especially. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lawler. Okay. So, 11 p.m. will be in draft. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, two, 11. All right, other, um, other segments of the ordinance to be raised. Are there any other segments? Okay. Under six has to do with the parking, the standing vehicles. Okay. I understand wanting to have, you know, um, sh you know, the shuttle or the transport where it would be temporary, where we'd be dropping people off and not wanting to have, you know, coach buses idling there. <coughs> either in the street or behind the property and <coughs> between the house and I don't know if that's a garage or a barn but I'm imagining say the seminary wants to do say, say they want their trustees to come down and have a a program and a lunch or something under a tent during the day and they they shuttle them down from the seminary in a you know in like a 15 passenger van or a mini Van. I'm I'm seeing how the co the college does that frequently when we have we're transporting guests. We'll use the 15 passenger van or a minivan. And so I'm wondering why couldn't a vehicle like that be allowed to park on the property? Why would they have to go back out to you know the seminary or the college or wherever um, or the visitor center? I'm just wondering is there a way to you know, I understand not wanting to have buses there. That makes sense to me. But I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, a 15-passenger van or a minivan. Maybe because I drive a minivan and have for most of my adult life. I don't know. I yeah, this says any vehicles. I mean, the, to me, the most important provision of number six is the the mention of the RPP. Yeah. And so basically not stacking Absol the blocks absolutely. full of right. vehicles. But there is space, I think, to put a vehicle behind the house. If you had a, and I'm trying to think of. I know that some of our operations in town are very skilled at unloading buses and getting them out of there, <coughs> but I think that probably is because of parking meters. Possibly, I'm thinking of Baltimore Street. Well, we have a idling ordinance too. Right. Right. Yeah, we discussed that. Mm -hmm. That's what I say. I'm looking at the Eileen Lawrence, but I, I think what you're looking at, Ms. Lawson, is the idea, like, if they literally shut off, shut right. down. Right. So I guess my question then would be, if the vehicle <coughs> shut off, Chief, put you on the spot here. I know we discussed this already. If the vehicle shut off, it's now, I know you're going to, you're going to tell me a lot of different things about this. It's parked. And you're probably going to say it's. You? You're probably going to say it's already parked. So, like in an alley, if you're you gonna, stop you a vehicle, stopping, standing, or parking. Stopping is if you go up to a stop sign. The stopping is a temporary cessation of movement. 
yeah. standing is if they're loading or unloading passengers. Whether running or not running, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. It, yeah, as long as there's pe if there's people going in or coming off or they're loading or unloading, <coughs> that's standing. And parked is, it's going to be there, parked. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I might add, and I think, speaking to Patty's point, you're going to be hard-pressed to limit the parking of a 15-passenger van because it's like a passenger car. So you, you've got a registered, a, a vehicle that's registered as, as like a passenger car. You may want to move towards something like commercial vehicles which if you go over so many pounds, bigger buses are gonna to have to be registered as commercial vehicles. Uh, which we, I know in the, I say I just looked through our, our zoning's relatively searchable. So we do have a definition of commercial vehicle. Well, the vehicle code does. Mm -hmm. And so does that, but in our parking uh, ordinance, we do uh, have a definition of that. <coughs> Um, and it seems that the intent here is to avoid, it's not if, this would not include anything uh, on private property. This is specifically citing parking basically on the alley, street, or in-street parking okay. spaces. So two of those things you're right. not supposed to do anyway, <coughs> unless I'm mistaken. I don't think you're supposed to park in the middle of the street anyhow. Um, so, I know, I've seen it done. Um, the last is, is really, it looks like it's designed to protect the on-street parking spaces, okay, which are limited fine. in that area. I just was imagining um, people being dropped off from a 15-passenger van, and then the van has to leave, you know, to go a mile or a mile and a half away, you know, when it could park behind the property. So, okay, maybe that's moved. Yeah, I don't think it has anything to okay. do with private property as okay. I read it here. Um, <coughs> other items to discuss in the zoning text amendment you may want to go back to e okay or remove or remove e because of what we've just done with d okay so and, and yeah what had been done there was that those were staggered and i did miss that in the sense that they kind of worked together um that's the provision about radio audio equipment Sound amplifier, television, all the things I read before, musical instruments, similar device. And I guess, I don't know, it, I feel like I'm kind of rehashing, but the same thing I get concerned is we're going to put somebody, probably a police officer, but could be a code enforcement employee, in a position to decide, to try to decide whether to cite or not, and then send it to a magistrate about these sounds going across a property line at 10:30 at night that's kind of what we're setting up i mean that's true now though i mean in all fairness like that you know i used to Honestly, joke if you want to talk about if you want to talk about disturbing noise enforcement i'm going to tell you that it's my druthers and what i try to get the officers to do is to enforce unreasonable noise under the crimes code because it's much better vetted out in case law than individual borough ordinances about unreasonable noise. So if they go and they're going to cite somebody for unreasonable noise under disorderly conduct, there's scads of case law. <coughs> this could be unreasonable noise, that could be unreasonable noise, this isn't, whatever. As opposed to the Gettysburg Borough Noise Ordinance where there, it's, you know, nothing case law wise to, to draw it in. So I try to push them more towards the state law on things like that. Now in this case, we would probably enforce it under an ordinance. Um, and try to draw it back or move it towards, well, this would be disorderly conduct under <coughs> Section 5503 of the Crimes Code. Um, but uh, so the, uh, that's, what I, that's what we do, just, just for informational purposes. If it's unreasonable noise, we're going to look first at disorderly conduct because it's much more defined. Okay, so related to item E, the, uh, the times in the ordinance draft are after 8 p.m. on a Sunday, which I think now would be Sunday through Thursday, which had been stricken <coughs> earlier, and after 9 p.m. on a Friday and Saturday. Uh, desires to change that, and if so, to what time? Well, if we're changing the other one to 11, why wouldn't these change to 11? That's what I was expecting to hear. And now I need to know if we have... Or is it irrelevant to have E if we've already done with D? I 
I see what you're saying. So yeah. that he could just go. Your your point, Mr. Carr, is that it's essentially moot, right? Before it was a staggering operation. We're going to shut down the noise before we shut down the cleanup. And if they're the same time, your your sentiment is what's the <clears throat> you know what's the point, right? It has I'd, to be done. I'd either I'd either remove it. Either remove two proposals, or make it remove e completely, or change it to um, or change it um, to eleven, or something else. Uh, I'd like to hear whatever what other what colleagues have to say. People of the board. Council should say. I think Mr. Lawler already said eleven, so I don't think I need to call on him again. Yeah. I mean, I like the idea of uh, of the noise stopping so that they have plenty of time to start cleaning up and getting out by eleven. So maybe nine and ten. Okay. <clears throat> I would support that. Yeah. Nine so and ten. Because you start to the music kind of is an. The music you know, tells audio, people right it's a, right it's over go to home letting people let's start know, cleaning up right to start packing up and right okay so i have uh Ms. lawson and mr carr one nine and ten others for nine and ten Ms. butterfield mr. I can support that. okay it's better same status you have four. Okay. Where do you want to speak? Well, I'm okay with this in other zones, but I have the problem with the these changes in the Elm Street zone, which I don't. So, no, I understand. I, I think I made the, that clear a bunch of times. And that's and yeah. No, I do. I do appreciate that we won't necessarily rehash every single opinion that we've expressed over probably a year. Um, but yeah, there are some concerns with the way this is right adjacent and kind of a mix zone. But like Chief has explained, if there is a complaint, he would go out there and try to point it at a different case law. So if it gets out of hand, it's going to be shut down. Well, and that's going to say that just comes to the, that's the opinion of the, the various legislators here of which, you know, how to handle that. All right. Other items uh, within the ordinance people would like to discuss. I, I this may just be implied, but okay. under um, seven, um, in the narrative t towards the very end, where it's, it's addressing addressing non-compliance issues within a reasonable amount of time after re receiving notification of such violations, is it implied that it's a written? Notification? Do we need to add written in there, or how is that handled? I think that it probably would be written, but it's not necessarily a bad idea to. Mr. Eastman, I saw you oh. punch. <laughs> so we'd add the word written, is what I was suggesting. There, yeah, you'd, you'd add. Written. So it'd be after receiving written notification of such violations. Okay, and I just want to make sure I'm I'm in seven, correct? Uh, right, it's, it's yeah, before you end, get to A. Like the last? Okay. The very last yep, yep, part. Yep, yep. Uh, right, repeated noncompliance with zoning. All right. Anyone uh, opposed to adding the term written? Like that's fairly Right, benign. receiving written notification of such violations. <coughs> Anyone opposed to that addition? I think that's whether it's someone with a you know notepad or a, a letter or whatever it is written is written and that's probably best I think Mr. Eastman would probably agree yes all right um, other adjustments I had a question on E what and it's underlined here what do we mean by nuisance management measures Let's see what this little oh, why am I not what is that off-site and on-site nuisance management measures and procedures <clears throat> what is the word nuisance? Why, why is that in there? I'm, I'm trying to 
Oh, sorry. No, I'm on, trying to. So I'm looking at this one. Um, number seven. No, no, I have it. I'm, I'm looking at this one, uh, Adobe Acrobat. <coughs> okay. And as such, I can tell that the... Um, I need to open it up in Word. I can see that there's a notation, but I can't read the notation. Um, all right. And now I need to... I don't use a lot of Microsoft products anymore. I think how I read that is if there's a nuisance reported, how how is the management going to handle it on site and off site? Okay. Um. Why is it management's problem if it's off site? No. For example, well, true, but I, I think it mean I don't. Maybe it's meaning if the manager is not on site when a nuisance is reported. I don't think anybody in this room in, knows why that was gonna... included. I don't. I mean, that language was added by Carly, and she's not here to answer that he question. Doesn't. So I don't think anybody knows what that means. Yeah, nuisance. I can't. Right. That it seems like something we would need the input of. Okay. Um, we'll just maybe put a question mark next to it then. Mm -hmm. we'll okay. With Carly. I, I was more curious. I was curious what okay. what that meant, you know. Gotcha. And ultimately, it needs to be what you intend. Council is the legislative body, so. No, I understand that, but the question is, why was it put in? Uh, and right, I don't point. know. It was Feel six like months ago at nine oh, o'clock in the morning, <laughs> added by Ms. Marshall, and I wasn't there, so I can't answer that. No one, no one else yeah. can either. <clears throat> okay, I think I have that articulated correctly. Uh, other items of discussion? Well, since I was never in favor of the management plan, if I understand it correctly, if they don't have all their events set up, year in advance to turn in the management plan, what happens? What happens if they get somebody who wants to do something and they've already turned in their management plan? They have to file an amendment with the management plan? So make an alteration. I see what you're saying. I, I believe that this had nothing to do with individual events. This has to do with the overall operation of the venue. This was, an, this was a way to make sure over time that the management of any particular special events venue was operating in a responsible way that was not uh, damaging the um, lived experience of neighbors and it was included as a way of adding an annual review to the um, okay. process to make sure that we were not um, just green lighting problematic business practices. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, when I read this section, there are kind of two things that uh, one of them in the borough and one of them outside of the borough that come to mind. Um, one within the borough that comes to mind is uh, how we regulate uh, essentially our cafe dining, right, to the point now that we have pins that are in the ground that dictate, hey, this is where it is, and then you know where it's at. Um, and the other was outside the borough, um, some involvement in some larger outdoor events, and they were only held once a year, but there would always be this kind of examination of where are all the things. Okay, how far off the property line are, are you with parking? How far, where are the, the portable restrooms? And I think the intention of this is to try to avoid that um, kind of almost every event, where is, where'd you put it this time? Are you 10 feet off? Um, I think that's kind of the idea there. Okay. All right. um, other items to discuss within the, the ordinance? I don't have an item question, but just a general comment. In talking to third ward people about this issue, I found similarities to when we were addressing the open container ordinance downtown. People who were wanting 
permission for ordinance uh, open containers, saw reasonable, mature adults carrying a glass of wine from one corner to the parklet to hear the music. Those who were against it saw um, out of control drinkers falling dead asleep in the alleys. So it, a little bit in this issue, the people who think it's a good idea see lovely outdoor events under control, abiding by our ordinance. Those who are opposed to it see animal <coughs> house parties out there um, raising the roof and disturbing the neighbors. And that makes for um, disagreement. It's unfortunate, but that's how people see things. So um, the other point I wanted to make in this particular case showed me that petitions are not always valuable in making decisions. Because early on we heard about the petitions of all the people who were think this was a fine idea. And then later we heard of petitions, so many of them the same people who were opposed to the idea. Um, it, it just made my view of petitions lessened of the importance thereof. Now, if people who'd signed those petitions had come and spoken to us themselves, I would put more value on it than I do now. And some did. Very few, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, it, there are kind of two things I could comment <coughs> there. Um, I don't think it's really fair to necessarily pen everybody into, like, the extremes. Um, you know, I think of when we bought our home and I thought, ah, we're close to some younger people and no one will ever bother us about having a party in the backyard. Uh, and now I'm not quite so young and they're pretty good about things, but I'm like, okay. And then they calm down, you know, by a certain hour. Um, when it comes to petitions, uh, and this is something I always discuss with my students when we talk about, um, we don't have this in Pennsylvania, but in some states they have initiatives. The citizens can literally mm -hmm. legislate from the sidewalk, and the difficulty with initiatives is finding someone who's going to stand there and read it before they sign it, and many people will not sign unless they really read the text. And I remember we did 9 to 7, and it was kind of painful sometimes, you know. Folks really wanted to know what was going on, and that was like a paragraph. Mm -hmm. It was not that incredibly long. Um, so yeah, sometimes petitions and how they're presented can be difficult, very difficult. Uh, are there any other items to discuss? <coughs> All right, so what I'll be doing is sending a copy of my notes to Ms. Marshall and Mr. Eastman. We'll get that into a, uh, I'm going to call it a tentatively final draft form. Does that sound fair here? Uh, well, what we have to get to go to, to, to set public a, a public hearing. Um, now, as Mr. Eastman mentioned earlier to me, you know, we could alter that language, then we would have to hold another public hearing if we did that. Um, so this is, you know, steps along in the process. But you can kind of get a sense of where, where this is headed. Okay. So think, uh, think nice and hard before February. <coughs> All right. That takes us to the next item, which is the uh, discussion of provision of satellite dishes in the historic district. Um, this is English. You want to discuss this a little bit, explain. This is an old one. Um, this comes from this, this. The numbering of this reminds me how Charles reacted <coughs> to dealing with where does the council go, circa 2016, that there were at least 40 PBSs because there was always this discussion of what what is the staff going to do and seven people trying to push the staff in different directions. Well, maybe not seven, but quite a few at the same time. So, satellite dishes. Well, Susan Noggle started with this process and had a draft, and we did work through the draft, checked other um, municipalities, and came up with a uh, ordinance draft that I did put in your folders with some other information. And right now we don't have a lot of enforcement when people put up new dishes because the old dishes become inoperable, and then they end up with, you know, five, six, or seven dishes, maybe only two or three are in use. So we're trying to get something that's a little more, uh, that would tighten up the ordinance to allow code enforcement to go out and 
you know, give them a, a notification to remove the inoperable dishes. Um, and any dishes that would be on the front facade would have to go through HARB, and any dishes that they would more, you know, be able to put or screen into the rear or side yards would be an administrative approval. So that would also encourage people to, to not put them on the front or, you know, rooftops of the historic structures in town. So we're just trying to clean up the um, satellite dish problem and create an ordinance that will give us a little bit more um, backing for code enforcement. Yeah, and if I recall this and I was reviewing the draft, you know, a lot of it is phrased as per unit as opposed to per structure. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of this, I think, remember, was being driven by essentially when people move, mm -hmm. they don't take down their satellite dish, then suddenly you have an array of four or five or more satellite dishes. On and the when same the company area. comes in, they won't remove the old one. They only put up their new one, and we end up with a lot on there, Sounds and it does like damage the roof as well. So. <coughs> Except they're not covered by the Utility Act. Yeah, I know. I'm just never amazed. Like, I'm, I'm driving down the street, and here's a utility line, not electric, but a utility line, just coil up and hanging in the middle of the block. Like, that's that's what you do with that. You know? Yeah, no, I asked a dish installer once why they don't remove them, and he said it's because we penetrated the roof, and if we pulled the bolts out, then we have to pay to repair your roof and make sure it's an impermeable membrane, and we're not going to do that. Yeah, when I fixed my old roof before I had it replaced uh, or built over, I, I kind of picked out three or four suspects, and they were all things like that. And I took the old flex seal up there and just started going. <laughs> uh, it worked. Yeah, worked five years. Um, comments about this? I noticed one thing that seemed to be added was solar modules, and I think that's probably wise. This seems to be a that's something else that's coming more, down, so um, we wanted to address that as well. But you know, uh, this just seems to be more applicable now. Um, and candidly, that's something I thought was covered by HARB, but if it's not, that's probably a good idea to make it nice and clear. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, that's something that I looked at with my own property. <coughs> Comments about about the satellite dish uh, proposal? Years ago, there was a movement by a group of residents who wanted no dish to be <laughs> visible from the street. And that went away when it was pointed out that some apartment situations that cannot be, right. that they had to be pointed a certain way. And so that whole issue went away. Do you remember that, Harry? Yeah. I, um, but that was a very vocal request and very strongly felt, fervently felt by the people who wanted that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think I see in the, dress, that in the, the draft that essentially, and I do remember this, that it's basically if there is no way, Correct. then and you I did do talk what to you some must. Rental, um, contractors and they are a lot of times putting in their lease that no dishes are allowed on the rooftops um, so they they have concerns too with the damage uh, you know on their properties and this is not inclusive of mass and antennas either right um, so that's covered separately all right so are people in favor of moving this forward I'm certainly all right with moving this forward Mr. Lawrence Butterfield Mr. Moon Burger, Slauson. All right, so let us proceed, and uh, I'd say get to some more finalized. But this probably needs to go to Harry's desk, and okay. we can start that process. Um, all right. Any other discussion of satellite dishes? Uh, if not, we will discuss the um, uh, chief. I'm going to ask you to kind of preface the program that is related to this uh, mental health cooperative agreement. <coughs> so the the. Uh Agreement is reference a co-responder from uh, a lot of sources. If you if if you look at the agreement, they're they're being uh, if the program <coughs> is being kind of directed, if you will, by uh, MHIDD of York Adams County, and and I kind of brought the authority on the subject here tonight. Bruce Bartz is kind of spearheading the project. He's with MHID uh, for York and Adams County, and he has with them the co-responder. Um, but the co-responder, um, in my mind, uh, really helps us, and you've heard me before talk about I dislike going out and throwing Band-Aids on problems to go back out two days later put another Band-Aid on the problem. Um, this, we, we have a mental health issue uh, with homeless and other folks, and the co-responder will help and come out and de-escalate situations. We'll do much-needed outreach 
to some of these folks, um, and they're the co-responders much more aware of the resources that, that can be dynamic in the uh, it, when, when dealing with some of these folks that have some mental health issues and. Uh, um, and they will, and the co-responder, as the name says, can respond with the police to these scenes and, and, and kind of, I hesitate to use the word take over, but assist once the, the police make sure that scene is safe. Um, and I would, uh, I'd ask Bruce to come up and just explain the program real quick. And I, I would preface it with, this is literally a, a no cost issue for the borough, um, other than Perhaps if it cost us to have uh, Trace to give the co-responder network access and the, cl and, and the, the cost of a fob for the co-responder to be able to enter the police station. Uh, we can fit them in there or fit her in there and, and work her into some of the cubicles that are in there already. And basically, as it's been explained to me by, by Mr. Bartz, it's, it's, it, uh, we just need network access and a printer fax machine. She'll have her own phone. Um, and I started just kind of a tripartite thing. Um, so the program is managed by MHIDD, but the co-responder is going to be an employee of Wellspan, right. contracted by MHIDD, uh, and it's paid for by a grant, but I'll, I'll let Bruce go through all that. Uh, so I'll, I give you Mr. Bartz. Yeah, thank you very much, Chief. Uh, my name is Bruce Bartz. I am the uh, community liais liaison for York Adams uh, Mental Health, Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And that's why we use MHIDD because that's a mouthful. So real quickly, if I can, um, I've never been to the borough here before except okay. for White Week or anything else. Uh, I'm from York. <coughs> but there, there's, you guys are obviously rich in, in history and stuff. And so here's my history with, with Gettysburg Borough is I went to school at, in, in Ohio. I had a buddy who played for Ohio State, my best friend in life. And he comes here every year to Gettysburg for his family vacation and has been doing it since he graduated from Ohio State in 1982. And then how this program relates into that, <clears throat> I was had the honor of meeting your mayor the other day and we have a connection through kind of mental health through a mutual friend from York who her and I have both lost our sons who are in the army together. And that's how I'm connected with mental health. And um, so this is a program, it's, it's, it's a win-win situation for everybody. So there are some connections made here for that reason. And, uh, but anyway, so what I want to do is, first of all, I want to introduce you to my co-responder. This is um, Mackenzie Johnson. She is actually a WellSpan employee. Um, she has been designated for the co-responder for Adams County. Now, what the co-responder does, it's a, actually a mental health clinician who's trained in crisis that's embedded in the police department. Now, the need for one co-responder with every department just really doesn't work that way. So what we have is we're going to try for three departments. Uh, one's going to be Cumberland uh, Township Police Department, which I think uh, this gentleman over here is a little bit familiar with because we've been dealing with them with our MOU. And, of course, Gettysburg Borough. And then we're also going to utilize her with the state police. And it's kind of a pilot program here in, in uh, Adams County. Uh, we've been doing it for a little over a year in York County. But the thing is, like, like the uh, chief said, we at MHIDD, we received the grant to run this program. They're WellSpan employees, receive the grant, and they work for you guys. It's basically how it works. So it's very simple. Um, when you guys have needs for mental health, and it's not just mental health, it is any type of services that are needed within the community. Um, They've been used on domestics, all kinds of different situations. In fact, we already used, just today, we used um, Mackenzie for a situation over in Cumberland Township um, for, a, for a woman who's just moved to, to, uh, into the area. She's from New York. She just lost her 19-year-old son. Um, and what she did, what Mackenzie did, is made contact with this woman, and she'll be able to give her resources and how to get her kids registered for insurance, what kind of resources that she would need for grieving, stuff like that. So that's kind of how that works. Um, I understand you have the, the hospital here where you, you know, all your 302 commitments go to, and there's a big issue with that. Mackenzie will be able to help out in those kind of things. So like the chief said, it's a situation where she does not go out and respond to calls by herself or anything like that. The police deem that the scene is safe, 
and then she can go out and assist the police. The police are in control, but it's been working out so good. It's like, and I'm, I'm a retired cop, so it's like, we got somebody who can kind of do our job. I'm like, it's all yours, and we can kind of walk away from that, so it helps that out. But uh, it's a very good program, and basically I'm excited to get it started here in the borough, in the township, and with the state police. Um, the biggest issue we have right now is just getting the, uh, the memorandum of understanding signed um, by the borough, and we're ready to go. What we require, and I was here with the chief the other day, <coughs> um, and your department <coughs> fit perfectly for her as her home department. Um, she just needs a workspace. She needs connected to the internet, and we need a copper copy scanner. That's all we need. So when she gets what we call a CIT sheet, which is a critical, uh, the uh, critical, uh, or the crisis intervention team, um, an officer gives her that sheet. She comes up and does a follow up with that. <laughs> Um, and then she scans the paperwork for us. We track the numbers of all she does. Um, and I, I don't think I gave this to the chief before, but then we can collect data, whatever data you need, so that we can keep this program running. <clears throat> it's a great benefit to your consumers, your, you know, your constituents, and, and all the people within the borough. It's, uh, I think that is the same one, yep. Yeah, this is just filled out. This one's okay, yeah, that, one, <laughs> that one's live. So with some statistics. But um, it, it, like I said, it's a very easy program. Um, and the, the best part of it, it doesn't cost the borough anything but connected to the building of FOB, maybe some paper here and there, and that's, that's pretty much about it. So I don't know if you've had a chance to read the uh, MOU, but if you have any questions about the MOU, I'd be more than happy to answer them. It was, uh, I had emailed it, this, just so for your information, I had emailed the MOU to Harry. <coughs> Uh, last week or the week before. I have before. reviewed that. I don't have any real legal issues with the format of the MOU. We did, just, just so council's aware, I, I did ask Bruce to add a few things simply because we are the home of the hospital. Uh, so I wanted to make sure we were protected in, in that regard. And we're the home of, of Gettysburg Cares. So a lot of surrounding agencies are bringing their homeless folks in to, especially in the winter, for, for a warm place to stay. Um, so some of those folks do end up in the borough, so uh, I wanted to make sure that we, we had some protection in the memo. Um, but Bruce, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, in, in the York County Departments, they were all just signed off on by their chief of police? Um, for the city, the mayor signed off, um, and I believe the borough manager signed off, okay. um, and everybody else, just the chief, signed off for the townships and what have you. So. Um, here's another great thing that, that's really happened with the uh, co-responders and the relationship with the mental health community. It's, 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 it's getting there to decriminalize mental health. Yeah. Um, you know, when I talk about di mental health with different entities, I, I usually look at the room and, and say, you know, there's nobody that doesn't have some type of mental health issue, probably even in this room. And when we say the word mental health, we mean anxiety, depression, those type of things too. And it's a great resource. It's just a great resource for the community <coughs> to make that connection. Cuts down on arrests, cuts down obviously our incarceration. Now your numbers from your police department, they could very well go down as far as arrests. But it's actually a cost saving thing for the municipality in the long run. Can you talk a little bit about where the funding is coming from and what sort of longevity you think that funding stream has? We are sustained through 2000, the end of 2024. Um, it's a grant that was uh, given to York Adams MHIDD. It <coughs> came from CCBH, which is, I don't even know what the CCBH stands for. It's, it's a mental health provider. Um, yep, there Say we go. something, something behavioral health. Yeah, so, um, but that's, that's, where the, that's where we received the grant for. And that's why we're putting the numbers in there for sustainability. So hopefully that um, when that grant ends, um, we can continue with it. My personal thing I'd like to see is co-responders tying in with the 988 system and how that works, and co-responders actually to be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We run it off what's called the Memphis model, if you want to look that up, which is a model that was created in Memphis, Tennessee which has mental health clinicians, they're actually by themselves. They don't even respond with the police anymore. They just respond directly to mental health um, situations. 
So it's all going to tie in at some point, too, with mobile crisis. Uh, I think you have two north here that's here in, in uh, Adams County for mobile crisis. Um, so hopefully, to me, there's quite a bit of difference. There's that community connection where you have your own co-responder within your community. They become familiar with your consumers. A lot of times, the consumers now in York County, they don't even call the police anymore. They call directly to, uh, to the co-responder for advice or whatever they need to do. I can think of one example. We have some, some lady in, uh, that lives in York Township, and every time she gets her electric bill and can't pay it, she calls MedEd and says, I'm going to kill myself by jumping off her porch, which is only this high off the ground. However, she doesn't call MedEd anymore. She calls our co-responder in that area, and they, they take care of it for whatever means. So. Lawson. You yeah. had mentioned Cumberland Township as well, um, and it would be inclusive of like Straban as well. It would be like Gettysburg, Straban, Cumberland. PSP covers Straban, which would is it, right outside right. the borough. Correct. Limit. Correct. So side. whatever municipalities, um, <coughs> and the state being a different entity, um, it's it's going to be a little bit more difficult. We're going to try. We're working on. It's going to be a different MOU for the state. Yeah. Um, right. They but, don't have their own law enforcement out at Straban. Exactly. I think it's I think it's really wonderful. I mean, I, I when you read about police departments that are working with, you know, with someone who is, uh, you know, a provider of mental health services, it has cut down on arrests. And when you read news stories, you know, national stories about someone who's been arrested or, you know, tasered or shot, and you read the story and you can almost read between the lines and see that. You know, it's somebody who's obviously struggling with some mental health issues. So I really applaud this effort. I'm I'm really glad that you're here tonight, and I'm glad that you're working with our chief. Well, I appreciate um, that. It, and it's and it's when we talk about mental health and and, and crime, don't don't get me wrong. We're not going to release the Charles Mansons from prison, and those are the people obviously with serious mental health, and you know, are still going to be, you know, uh, institutionalized or what have you. It's it's that homeless person that you know what, I'm going to steal that because. The prison is a good place to, to uh, you know, get a, get a warm meal or what have you. So it really helps in, in that manner. Or somebody who doesn't, who can't afford their medication, and they're off, they're non-compliant with their medication, and they're Absolutely. just acting out in a way, you know, they don't need to be arrested. They need some care. Absolutely. So I think that's really wonderful. But we also, I'm sorry, we also talk about the fact that mental health also gets into the abuse issues, like drug abuse, alcohol abuse. Domestic abuse, child abuse—it all is part. Absolutely, um, we're we're starting a pilot program in Han in the Hanover area with Hanover Penn Township and West Manheim Township with um, certified recovery specialists. It's it's a proven fact that peer-to-peer -peer, um, trauma-based uh, therapy is what works. So if you have someone who's a certified recovery specialist, for those of you who don't know, it's someone who's been addicted to drugs, who has cleaned themselves up, has the education now, and they can be a peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, we do it in the police. We do it in the military. Um, we're also doing it in the, in the, with the kids in schools. Um, and that's something our co-responders has also done too, is our co-responders have gone into the schools to assist in that way also. So there could be some training for our de our police department then as well. In other words, to help identify, would there be some training with the department, with officers in the department, or there, just to help identify, you know, when there is a need to call in the other resources, the additional right. there resources. There is what's called uh, CIT International, which is uh, crisis intervention training. Um, that's worldwide. And they have a CIT team here that trains police officers here in Adams County. Okay. So, okay. Um, thank you. The, the police have always been for, for mental health. You know, our job has always been that, that de escalation and that bridge to crisis service and further counseling and, and mental health support through commissions. So, this program just makes that bridge a little shorter, much easier to pass. So, you know, it, it, really, it really improves our chances of getting these folks connected with the resources they need as opposed to us trying over and over again. And as I said before, going there and putting a Band-Aid on it for the night to go back two nights later to put another Band-Aid on. Now we have the ability to put a little time in at the front end and maybe 
you know, have that, don't, not have to use the Band-Aid. It's a permanent fix so that now that person can go to those resources and they don't keep, you know, I'll use the term acting out, but, but they, they, don't, they don't repeat that behavior. So this program is, is important to us as well because then it frees us up to do the other things um, that, that, that we need to do. So, I mean, it, it, it's a, this is an incredibly good program. And we do send our officers to CIT. Thank you. Uh, when, when I was sworn in in January of 2020, the first meeting I had was with the chief, and I asked if, if we had ever pursued any sort of co-response, and he said, oh my God, I'd love to, but where, where's the money going to come from, right? So um, <coughs> it, it's <coughs> really great to be involved in a pro program like this. I understand that it'll, it could be temporary, but um, thank you, chief and Bruce, for bringing the program to uh, our area. Um, there, there's a number of things we ask our police to do that just really aren't their jobs. You know, they're the dog catcher, they're, and then sometimes they're a behavioral interventionalist. Uh, I think we can all reflect back on things that have happened in the borough where um, a um, mental health professional might have been able to contribute to a different outcome than what we did have. Um, Will your services be on call at all, or are you going to be sort of restricted to daytime office hours? Or, you know, if there's a situation at one in the morning that just needs you, are they able to call, or is that, is that not part of the program? Typically, they work shifts from 12 to 8, 1 to, 1 to 9, or 2 to 10, the evening shifts, because that's typically where they, and it's Monday through Friday, um, that's where the hours are at right now. That's the most need. Um, if you have a situation where 1 o'clock in the morning where you need a 302 or a commitment, um, that's their discretion. Um, and some of them right now are answering their calls almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. So there's going to be some restrictions on that. We have had, and to, to your question, I mean, we have had meetings about that, about yeah. what's the call-out procedure or the call-in procedure, after-hours procedure going to be. And uh, we just probably spent yeah. 15 or 20 minutes on it in the last organizational yeah. meeting we had just last week discussing this and they were going to take it back and it's and it's still it up in the air to be honest with you um we you know we want to to, to me if and i'm not an analytical person um i love basketball and i could care about the numbers larry bird whether he got the he's still the best player in the nba or whatever but anyway um if we produce the numbers, if we can show that, and it doesn't have to be all mental health related, like the mayor said, it makes this connection with everything. If we can connect all these, that's where the funding is going to start coming from. Right now, there is no money in mental health. So there, there is a data <coughs> collection element to what you're doing as well? Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And that's We're, the metric by which the program is being judged? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so. As my colleagues know, I, I serve on our um, county's overdose task force as well um, and we've pined away for a co-response uh, element in law enforcement here in the county and um, I, I think that the task force will be ecstatic to hear that this program is being launched so thank you both Can I share some of these we'd love to have you come talk to the out? task Absolutely. force sometime too so I so in our last meeting, Bruce had handed out this sheet that's the filled out one of the, their their data sheets, and and just just to give you an idea of what the co-responders are seeing in York County, um, for the month of December 22, they did 17 302 commitments, which is a mental health commitment. That's it may not sound like a big number, but that's a staggering yeah, number. That's a lot. That's a staggering number of emergency involuntary commitments. 17 is just that's a lot. Um, the uh, they assisted or they they went to six domestic disputes and assisted with those. Um, mental health incidents that didn't rise to the level of a 302 or any type of commitment, 29 of those. For 11 of those, no police departments were present. So they were called by that consumer or, or another treatment provider and, and they went and dealt with that. Um, one overdose, they had 10 walk-ins, 16 welfare checks, and one unknown. So that's 81 total calls, seven of them were repeats, and then they even classified it down to veterans. Um, it's so like one, two, or three calls to 911 center were 138, and the CIT officers dispatch were 74. So, I mean, it, it, it's now that's uh, that's all of York County, or just <coughs> no? That's the entire county of York. Still, still that's 
it, that's a quite the workload um, when you're when you're figuring these these aren't five or ten minute encounters. So uh, it, it's it's going to be a busy program. Uh, some some of the numbers that are important too is uh, the psych one two and three calls for the for the month it was it was 138 and that's to all our different police departments in New York County. Um, I gathered the numbers for the CIT what, psych one two and three calls from York County on a monthly basis, and I also am now gathering from Adams County from 911 on a monthly basis. In York County in December they had 138. Um, in Adams County in 2021, they had 212 for the entire year. Jeez. It's not that they're not out there. It's just not being reported. That's the difference. It's the people <coughs> aren't understanding that the resources are there available. It's also that stigma that's attached to mental health. It's that person who's afraid to say, yep, I'm, I'm not feeling it right now and I need some help. And the same with drugs. It's the same thing and they're all interconnected. Uh, like I said, a lot of this stuff is above, above my pay grade. It, it just makes me wonder why can't we get help for someone who has drug issue and mental health issue, but they're separate, but yet one goes hand in hand with the other. Yeah, I have mental health issues because I do drugs and I have do drugs because I have mental health issues. and but it's still separate. So I, I, I know this board is well aware of the number of times I've come in here and talked about overdoses and the use of Narcan and how many times our police officers are going out and doing that. And that's that's just, as Bruce is saying, another area that this could really assist with. Yep. Um, so I'm going to knock on wood because we've been... <laughs> well, and, and how, we, how we hopefully develop that in yeah. is that we have that Narcan incident. So let's say it's here in the borough. Now we have our co-responder who can connect that person, if they're willing, to um, a recovery specialist. So hopefully that person can get into recovery and the Narcan isn't needed. So, I mean, that, that's, and, and this is on a personal note for me, I, I, I lost my son seven years ago to suicide. Uh, he was in the military. And there is no doubt in my mind that a high majority of these people that are doing drugs are th saying to themselves, I hope to God this is the last one I have to do. I hope this is the one that kills me because they don't want to be addicted to drugs. It's an addiction. I really believe that. I, that could be a debate between amongst us. And I'm a retired police officer. When I, when I first heard mental health clinicians working side by side with cops, I thought no way in heck this is ever gonna happen. And now I'm totally sold on the program. So um, another thing this does too is very close to veterans. Um, we are also starting here in, in the county a connection with a veteran network and how our co-responders are, are interacting with that is when a veteran's in crisis, that co-responder comes directly to me and I take it directly to your office of veterans affairs. So that veteran gets that help that they need too. So it's, it's just a win-win situation for everybody. And we'd like to make it big enough so we now have our nonprofits working in this and just make a connection for the entire community. So, okay. get her signed, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to get McKenna in here. She's looking this for would, something to yeah. do. And just real quick, if anybody has any questions about this, they, they're hesitant to let this program start without signed agreements on file. So yeah. this isn't gonna go anywhere if we don't, don't get this signed and going. And, and Mackenzie's here, <laughs> ready to go. So, uh, yeah, this would appear on our agenda for our February meeting. Um, and Chief, I, I feel like you've kind of addressed this already in your discussions you're having. Um, but the main uh, item that I looked at were the policies and procedures. We will need to modify some of ours, I believe, to address the inclusion of some of it's kind of written in, but then it's not exactly. And I just want to make sure that our people have the right direction of some of the things that came up here like so when it's 2 a.m. what should they do and that you folks work that out at a management level so they don't have to try to decide what to do and, and I think what that's going to come down to and I really haven't talked to Bruce about this as much but I think that's going to come down to that trained CIT officer in that situation if they're saying we really would think we need to co-responder here I think at that point in time they're going to reach out but I think that we need to vet that out 
Um, because again, <coughs> we talked about consistency before when you were talking about that ordinance. We had we need to have consistency across departments too, at, le at, at, at the least for Mackenzie's sake. Of well, what do I do? Because I'm in the borough today. I'm not out in Cumberland, right? Uh, or I'm, I'm in I'm in state police jurisdiction. I'm not in the borough. So I think that we need to have consistency across those those lines as well with the, with interaction with her. So I would agree. And real quickly, how it, how one of our co-responders so actually works for three different departments. Um, in York County she works and she averages right around 50 contacts a month with those three departments she has her home department where she starts in there she comes in she gets her paperwork from that department some IT <coughs> sheets she then goes to the next department and attends their lineup um, their briefing for all their officers that way out of sight out of mind if she's not at the briefing they forget she's working so she attends that briefing says hi guys here I am hey any issues Anything you want to let me know, who, who we're looking at, blah, blah, blah. And then she'll go to that third department and get her paperwork. And then she'll start, probably go back to her home base and do her follow-ups. I like them to do their follow-ups in person, if they can, if it's safe, because that makes that connection. We like them interacting with the police, because like I said, out of, my, out of mind, or out of sight, out of mind, if they're interacting, they're seeing each other, they're talking about it, um, the police, even whether they're CIT or trained or not, say, hey, i got this consumer and I just keep getting this call. How do I handle them? It, it's just a win-win and, and it's that great uh, cohesive relationship and partnership. So, um, yeah, she'll be shared between the three departments and if we get her busy enough, we'll see about maybe getting another one down here. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's just my assurance or your assurance that we'll get the policies and procedures taken care of on your end. and. They're there are suggested ones right there. Yeah, we'll get the procedure yep. up and running. And so uh, we have everything covered. But I mean, otherwise, on our end, it, it's not, <coughs> Kaylee, it's just not a lot more than what we already sort of do. There are things in there about, you know, safe work environment, things we have to do anyway. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for uh, absolutely. For I will, this I will do this one. Um, who, who will probably be signing? For a man. Probably the manager. For a manager? Yeah, we can have it over here with uh, Ms. Stahl, the secretary, probably the right person to be custodian of that. All right, I will uh, prepare the blank MOU with his name on it and title and stuff, and I'll send it to you, Chief. Okay. And um, candidly, we'll go from there. Council authorizes to, to sign. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You work that out. Yeah. Do you folks have contact <laughs> information? Yeah. Do you have contact information? Yes, I have. Uh, uh, it doesn't really matter. Exactly. It they're really, yeah, I mean, the council, the council's authorizing the agreement. Who is so affecting we, I that? I'd say we hire a manager, and that's who signs. If that's okay with you. All right. Thank you so All much. Right. This Thank is you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. All right. So that'll be equate the, the movement forward. Yes. Sir. All right. That takes us to the uh, Gettysburg Gateway Connectivity Project. Um, Mr. Gable, do you want to lead this off? This deals yeah. with essentially the future of our yeah. grants yeah. and design and things of that nature. Uh, just to recap, um, if you recall, back in 2019, the borough uh, submitted a Federal Lands Access Program grant request to the uh, Department of uh, Transportation. And that request was for the design and engineering of the mile-long project, now known as the Gettysburg Gateway Connectivity Project. Design and engineering uh, is going to cost $1,567,397. The FLAP grant has a 2080 match requirement, so the borough is responsible for 20% of that $1.567 million. The grant, the FLAP grant um, in early 2020 was actually um, appropriated for the borough. However, the full request of $1,253,917, which is the 80% uh, that the feds were, were going to, to match, was not granted. Instead, the uh, Highway Administration um, funded our project to the tune of $800,000. So since the borough did not get the full $1.253 million that was requested, uh, that left a sizable hole in our funding strategy of $767,397. Now, when we made the submission, the borough had already committed the 20% match, and that was $313,480. That money's currently sitting in our capital projects fund waiting to be expended. 
So when the flop grant was awarded it at the level of 800,000, we still had a 453,917 dollar hole to fill. We began our conversations with our partners at PennDOT, and uh, we have an agreement with PennDOT specifically through Rabbit Transit that uh, Rabbit Transit, through their relationship with PennDOT, will fund that hole of $453,917. So what's in front of you today is that agreement between the borough and Rabbit Transit for that local match <coughs> requirement. And <coughs> once, once all that's combined, we have the 800,000 and then 767,000 in local match, a combination between Rabbit Transit and the, the borough's contribution. We are funded to move forward with the design and engineering uh, of the Gettysburg Gateway Connectivity Project. So that's piece one, so what's in front of you, and piece two is if we get that funding appropriated and approved through council, then we can start talking about the arrangement between our borough engineer and the borough as it relates to that work that needs to commence soon. So. Why don't you go ahead, Chad, and then Council can discuss both at the same time. Okay. So, I'm really excited about this, because you know that we've been working hard for this for the last five years. So I don't want to take a lot of your time tonight, uh, because pretty much everything that you're going to hear tonight, you've already heard multiple times through the last five years. Uh, but I did, it, it is a significant project, right? $13 million project, something that we've been working really hard for. So I did want to uh, give it its due diligence here and, and, and discuss it with you just real briefly. Um, in your package, you have this six page engineering contract. Uh, what I try to do is boil it down and made some notes for myself. And I said, well, why don't I just give you guys the notes and that way you can take notes. You know what, I'm, I'll just get one to Jim too and he can take some notes and make this simpler than everybody. Um, so <coughs> when we're talking about project management, we talk about scope, budget, and schedule. So the notes that you see there, the bullets you see is broken down into those three general categories. Um, in terms of the scope of this project, uh, the Baltimore Street master plan really laid the groundwork, right? That's the master plan here, brought one for show and tell. And uh, that identified the limits of the, the project. It was to connect where President Lincoln came in on a train, stayed at the Wills House, proceeded out to the, um, to the cemetery out Baltimore Street. We dubbed it the, Lo the Baltimore Street Project, even though we had, know that it includes the square and a little bit of Carlisle Street. <coughs> um, that scope hasn't really changed. That's the limits of the project. It stayed consistent since 2018. There were some other um, efforts here that um, kind of tweaked some things that I'm going to go over, but really the limits of the project is the same limits. Uh, the, the flap grant in 2019, that kind of helped define the engineering amount. And I want to get to this in the budget again with, with the numbers that Charles just gave you. But uh, originally we were looking at it's a $13 million project. How are we going to do this? We're not going to be able to do this all at once. We're going to have to do this in phases. So we were looking at engineering in phases and having to do this two years and another two years and another two years. Obviously, that's more expensive than doing this all at once. When we got our partners from Michael Baker in here and they were helping us find grants for this, they said, ah, we think we can fund this all at once. And obviously there's an economy of scale there. Um, so uh, that was really the only thing that, that um, changed with the flat grant. We were able to boil all three into one project here. So we're going to be designing the entire thing at once. In 2021, uh, we had the uh, the rabbit transit component of this, there was a multi multimodal component. Like Charles said, there was a funding gap where PennDOT came in and helped us with that funding gap. But that they wanted to make sure that that multimodal component is um, covered in the scope of the project. So we tweaked some things with rabbit transit, where the bus shelters are going to go, the, the rabbit transit type of things. Make sure that uh, we're not only just designing for the commercial tour buses, but also the rabbit transit um, multimodal buses. Uh, and then in 2022, we had the raise grant applications. Uh, that was for construction dollars. Um, we actually applied in 2021 and 2022. We've been unsuccessful so far. We intend to reapply this year for, for construction dollars. But as we do apply for that, we learn a little bit each time. And we've been tweaking our, our scope of our project. The most significant tweak that, that happened through that is the council approved 
early last year, we approved to uh, do more improvements at the square. If you remember, the improvements in the square were pretty limited in the first in the, mas in the original master plan. Once we started getting into the process, we decided that we wanted to do a little bit more in the square. So that was really the only change in scope there. <coughs> One of the things, that, so the next bullet here is a PennDOT ECMS. Um, Charles and I are very, very familiar with the acronym ECMS, Engineering Construction Management System. It's PennDOT's management system. This project will be a PennDOT managed process. They will have a project manager assigned to the project. It will be have an ECMS number assigned to the project. We'll have to follow all of engineers, um, design, uh, PennDOT's design guide, guidelines, uh, the design manual one, design manual three. Um, I wanted to point that all out to you, not because this is a PennDOT road. This is because it's a PennDOT funded project. So it's not going to be an HOP per se because Baltimore Street's a PennDOT road. It's because the funds are going through PennDOT. Even the federal lands access yeah, program money, the federal money, has been already delivered to <coughs> PennDOT. PennDOT will be administering the projects, their monies, their roles. Right. That means a lot to me because a large and heavy uh, lift with the design efforts is going through the permitting processes with PennDOT. Um, so I just wanted to point that out there. A lot of the language that's in this document relates to the ECMS. I wanted to make it note uh, that there are sub-consultants that we're going to be bringing in on this project, just like every project. When we did Steinware, we had a specific traffic consultant. We always have an electrical consultant that we have to do if we're going to have decor decorative street lights. Um, so I wanted to make note that we're going to have those two. Oh, the historical and environmental uh, clearances will be right a requirement by PennDOT. Obviously, we're in Gettysburg, where we're rich in history, and there's going to be a historical component to this. So we're going to have to go through all of those clearances, and there, those are specialty services. And then the last one I, I listed there was a landscape architect. Um, as you know, I'm an engineer. I was in the military. I kind of work in my box, dress right dress. I'm also colorblind, so I'm not the perfect landscape architect, right? So <laughs> this project does justify and warrant having uh, a specialty service for that. So when we're designing things in the square, when we're looking at the gateway, we're going to have a landscape architect doing that. The other neat thing about a landscape architect is they're going to be able to do a better job. You know, whenever I present plans to you guys, it's very uh, black and white with all of the, the contours on it, and, and I, I can read it, but the general public might not be able to understand it exactly. Um, landscape architects will be able to take those and um, drawings and put them into renderings and so we can throw it up in the overhead and it's easy to understand. I even like to give it to a contractor so you can say here look here this is what we want this to look like. This is a construction drawings but this is what we want this to look like when we're done. So, Only exclusion really that I wanted to mention with the scope of the service is uh, the bidding and construction phases as we have identified that we don't have construction dollars identified yet. So uh, we can't foresee exactly what that's going to look like yet until we get to that phase. So those are just excluded from the scope of the service. Uh, I gave you some of those numbers that Charles just uh, gave you. Uh, the, the Federal Lands Access Program grant was $800,000. Uh, I'm going to skip over the borough. The, the PennDOT multimodal rabbit transit component was 453000 That leaves the borough's match 313000 It's the same number that's been in your uh, budget for the last couple of years since 2020 whenever uh, we found out that we were awarded this, this contract and, and like Charles said 2020 is whenever we did find out that we were awarded the, 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 the money of course COVID happened directly after and they didn't appropriate the money until just this fall so we've been working on finally getting this thing pushed across the, the goal line but it's the same number that you've been carrying on your um, your budget for a couple of years now I did want to stick a bullet in there. There was a $2.3 million design fee in the master plan. I don't want you to think that there's something that's being excluded because it's not 2.3. The main reason why there's the difference is because we're designing all three of these things <coughs> at one time. It's a significant change from 2.3 down to 1.5 by, by, by being able to do all of this at one time. Oh, and lastly, uh, I did not include in the design services at this point uh, which phases that will be billing the, the, the borough. I'll be working with the PennDOT manager once that is assigned. I'll be working with Tammy and your accounting department 
We'll make sure that we understand exactly how they want to see the bills because there are going to be some specific things like whenever they have a multimodal uh, component of the design, they're going to want to see those things built separately than everything else. So we'll just basically follow what pen dot standard are and we'll uh, massage our, our uh, invoices accordingly. Um, lastly, the schedule, uh, the, the flat worksheet that we had to provide for the uh, reimbursement agreement um, showed 21 months for the design here. We've been saying all along this is about a two-year design window. Um, of course, we will be providing a detailed schedule once the PennDOT uh, project manager is assigned to this. There'll be checkpoints that they're going to want to see. Um, they're also going to be uh, checkpoints that the borough council may want to see. So keep in mind that just because that this project is getting all permitting and approved by PennDOT, that doesn't mean it's not still your project. This is the borough's project. The scope is defined by the borough. So as many times as you guys want to see me, I, I come to your meetings anyways. So anytime you want to see a presentation on what's, what's the latest on it, you let me know, and I'll make sure that I, that I give you an update. Uh, if I don't hear anything from you, I will be bugging you to get on your agenda from time to time to say, okay, here's some options for how we want this to look. What do you think? So from time to time, I'll be coming to you, but otherwise, um, like I said, feel free to, to, to give me a shout if you're ready for a presentation on the project. And then um, lastly, I wanted to mention with the schedule, um, so we have, you, you've heard the phrase um, shovel ready. That's our, our catch word for what we're, our goal is at the end of this project. The end of 21 months, we want it to be shovel ready. Um, but of course, the schedule is going to be highly dependent on whether or not we're successful with our raised grant application and if we get construction dollars. If we get construction dollars um, earlier, we might want to try to move up that schedule. If we know that, the, that, that, we, that we just say we don't get to raise grant again this year, worst case scenario, and we have to apply a, a following year, then it might get pushed out another year until we can actually bid this project. But, I'm hoping that in the year 25, 2025 is whenever we'll be able to actually break ground on this project. So that's my wishful thinking. Uh, and I did stick a side note on the bottom there. Maybe side note isn't a, a good word. The attorney might say that you should use a stronger word, but there is terms and conditions with every um, engineering contract. It's stuff that I luckily, knock on wood, have never had to use in 20 years, but I just wanted to make mention that that is not included in the version that you guys saw in your package. So that'll be added. It'll be provided to Harry for his review. Um, and we'll make sure that that's all tidy before we get to um, your meeting in two or three weeks from now. So that's the skinny of the engineering draft. Um, again, I don't want to belabor the project. We'll have plenty of opportunities for questions and stuff and design considerations as we're going through this. It's going to be uh, my most important project for the next two years. So. So timeline, uh, if, if council is amenable to this, uh, both these will appear on your February agenda. Um, Rich Farr, the, pres uh, the executive director uh, of Rapid Transit, uh, and intends to bring this to his board in February. Once their board signs off, then I will execute the contract with, with PennDOT and get this moving by March. Yeah, so the kind of the extension of... Uh, I kind of like to limit the extension of the conversations and questions basically to the contents of the agreement at this point, right? That's what we need to deal with. So does anyone have uh, questions or, or comments for? Just congratulations, Chad and Charles. That's really, that's big, huge. I mean, when this was talked about a number of years ago, it just seemed so far, you know, off. The fact that in a couple of years it could be underway, that's really exciting, really, really exciting. Yeah, and good vision. I mean, there was lots of great vision with that. So It didn't seem like it was this far away when we <laughs> talked about it some years ago. I thought that, like, oh, three or four years, five years. Well, I'm thinking quite a with the connection that. with that yeah. PennDOT rep, that they may years. help us on the other end of the borough with the trail going out to the Historical Society in terms of reducing that speed limit and everything too I'm hoping maybe we can I always remember my conversations with Deb Adamick yeah whenever she would when we were starting the master the right. this table and I would say yeah. she's like so how, how long is this going to be until we actually get this constructed like, Deb this is this is a 10-year process she's like Chad don't ever tell anybody that <laughs> because they'll lose no, interest I, if it's yeah. 10 years I remember the level of detail <laughs> that people were talking about on printed out maps at this table and I was like <laughs> we've got a lot of steps to go <laughs> Yeah. So here we are five years later, and but we're just getting started with the design, and it's going to be another four or five years. So, But it's exciting because it's 
you can see it, you know? Yeah. That's great. It's, it's good for people to be excited about it. <laughs> Questions? Clapping. Any of the above. All right. If not, you never find me if you need it. If you come up with anything later. Like, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, let's try to balance when the <coughs> those things are coming on the work <coughs> agenda so we can make everything work as needed. Yeah, so the last item we had is uh, a, a conversation. Basically, this is kind of a a potentially preliminary discussion of whether or not there's interest in pursuing any changes at Stratton and Middle Street. So we've had some complaints. The chief has brought us um, some data about crashes, um, vehicle collisions, accidents. I don't know what verbiage you prefer. Crashes. Okay. They don't call them accidents anymore. I, I didn't know whether uh, Chad was going to be here tonight or not. I should have looked a little more on the agenda. So I pulled out some stuff from the MUTCD just to give you an idea about the warrants for a signal. Yeah, this is kind of like the conversation. Do you <laughs> want to pursue, do you want to even yeah. consider spending the money to pursue so, the warrants? Warrant number seven is crash experience at the intersection. I did five years worth of crash data. It's been a minute since I looked at doing any type of, of uh, traffic engineering study and, and being that, that involved with them. But our crash experience is not going to satisfy warrant seven. We've had I just put all the stuff back away, which was not my brightest move. Um, so we've had a total of 11 reportable crashes at that intersection in the last five years. Um, and 11. Um, now we've had 20 total crashes, but depending on how PennDOT looks at it, if they're going to look at it and they're going to give you a vehicle code definition of a crash, non-reportable crashes and a crash. Uh, they, they want reportable crashes, which means vehicles had to be towed or somebody was injured or killed. Uh, that's, that's the short definition of a reportable crash. And if you look at these, uh, and I even printed out the more in-depth definition for warrant number seven, which is the crash data, and it specifically says, the need for a traffic control signal shall be considered if an engineering study finds that all of the following criteria are met and within a 12 month period you have to have at least five crashes five reportable crashes at the intersection we are not going to meet warrant seven uh, didn't because we you have, have to five meet last year what's that didn't we have five no last we year? did not i thought that's what you told us at our last meeting no we didn't have five there we had two in 2022 two reportable crashes in 22 we had five reportable crashes in 21 but we had one in 22 and 19 and one in 2018 for a total of 11 reportable crashes at Stratton. Yeah, when I think of that intersection, often it's unfortunately kind of the, the polite way to say it, the frustration of the stupidity of some drivers. Probably the most polite way I can say it. Because I think there are a lot of close calls at that intersection because people just don't <coughs> Look or acknowledge the other three directions. And in town, we do have those tight uh, sight lines because of the buildings the way they are. And it's that's one of the intersections where it's very tight. But but it, yeah, the, I mean the statistics are as they are. To, to, to be there are there are nine total warrants listed in the MUTCD for traffic control signal. So warrant seven is crash experience. Um, you're not gonna you're not gonna meet warrant seven. So, I, and Chad could probably speak better to this. If you kick out any one of the warrants, it makes it more tough to justify a signal. So warrant seven is gonna go. Um, warrant one is an eight hour vehicular volume. Probably not there. Probably, probably not. not. Warrant two is a four hour vehicular volume. I, I don't think you're gonna get that even with, even with the you know, rush hours through there. Um, there's a peak hour consideration, a pedestrian volume consideration school crossing there's limited school crossing there because it's you know they spread out yes. before they get up to there um we i think they would consider that part of a coordinated signal system which you'd have on baltimore street and coming down then you have your crash experience as a part of a roadway network and as the intersection near a crossing grade i think there's multiple ones of those warrants we're not going to meet and I think that for, for council to say we'd like to do a study at that intersection to see if it would meet the, the warrants for a, a signal, I think you're throwing good money uh, away because I just it, it, it's not going to meet that one. Again, I, I think Chad can speak better to warrant requirements, but I, I don't think that it's probably a, 
a wise move at this time, for lack of a better term. <coughs> yeah, yeah, off the cuff, it, it's not necessarily easy to, to, to do that. Um, so it, it would, my, my, I go through that intersection every day, coming to, and maybe at peak hour you might get some, some of the trips that would warrant a traffic signal, but I don't know that there's going to be enough of the other things that are going to be able to back it up. It, it, would, it would be a long shot, at, at least. All right, further conversation on Stratton Middle? All right. Anything else before we go to public comment? Not public comment. All right, if not, we will adjourn.